Father, this morning I pray to be just a conduit, just a vessel. I am confident, Lord, that if you can speak through a donkey this morning, that you can use me to speak this morning, and I pray that you would do so. I pray that your word would reach open hearts. I pray that your word would reach prepared soil this morning and that it will accomplish that for which you send it. In your wonderful name, amen. This morning, I would like to speak on one of the most profound chapters in the book of Acts. Um, And I have wanted to speak on this chapter for some time. I could actually do a series on the information that's in this chapter. So we're going to cover off really quickly. Uh, The chapter we're going to look at today is Acts chapter 27. And what is inside of and the contents of this chapter is enormously profound on many levels. And we'll cover that off as we work our way through. Uh, Today, I want to highlight mostly we're going to be following the path of Paul. Uh, Two things that we need to know, there is a message from Paul. I I believe that as we go through this chapter, there is a message for each of us as the people of God that we can draw from Paul. I also believe that by the time we reach the end of the chapter, there is a message for Paul that applies very, very heavily to many people in this room today. Uh, most people here will know that when I was in Tasmania, I played AFL football. That's real football for those that are wondering, not the kind of sniff and shuff stuff you do up here. Uh, but uh, uh, I've noticed with, yeah, I can get into a lot of trouble real quick, Dennis. Uh, I'm just going to move this back a little bit. Uh, uh, but I noticed something with uh, uh, AFL teams, if you watch all the football teams. Uh, AFL teams, all of them have a captain. But for a moment, if you'll bear with me, you have to ask the question, Why? Like, when you look at cricketers, uh, I can understand why you have a captain. The captain's involved in the on-field decisions. They make field uh, changes. They, they, they make bowling changes. Uh, I don't know about the uh, um, 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 sniff and shove stuff. You, I, I can't remember the name of the thing you call football up here. Uh, but anyway, uh, I don't know how big a role the captain plays, but uh, do you know in AFL, the captain doesn't play a whole lot of a role or his role is reasonably bad. He doesn't make any decisions on the field. He doesn't move anybody on the field. He, the coach does all of that, which is a really great parable for the sovereignty of God. But that's a, that's a message for another day. We don't have time this morning. But the coach makes all the decisions. The coach makes all the changes. The coach may ask the captain to go and whinge at the umpires. He may ask the captain to do an interview. But the... AFL captain's role is enormously important. It may be perceived as being passive, but no matter what happens on the scoreboard, the captain plays the same intensity, no matter what happens on the scoreboard. When the chips are down, when everything's going haywire, when every other player is wondering what happened to the plan in the change rooms before we ran out, they're looking to this guy on the field who's the captain. When... The game reaches a crisis point. They're looking to the captain. Uh, I'm not sure whether you've ever heard this saying that a crisis makes a man. I want to tell you that's that's not right. A crisis never makes a man. A crisis reveals what a man is made of. I I know in my time in the forestry, uh, I deliberately and intentionally, I haven't changed my approach I deliberately and intentionally placed people into crisis situations to see which ones I could rely on. Things change. Because it's in a crisis we begin to see who people really are. And as we unpack today, we're going to see we have, I believe, Paul, without saying a word hardly, preaches a massive sermon to us today about what it means to be God's people in the crises of life. I, I can get into a lot of trouble real quick, but I want to tell you something. If you signed up to a gospel that sounds like as soon as you receive Jesus, everything's going to be rosy and he's going to make all your life here really easy and sweet, you need to go and get your money back. Because that's not in the Bible. And I, I'm not speaking prophetically this morning, but I'm here to tell you that life is full of storms. We're going to We're going to see what happens with one man. Life is full of storms. Life is full of crises. 
Last couple of years, most of us have been in somewhat of a crisis. Call it what you want. Some people say it's a massive health crisis with COVID-19. Some people are now saying it's a huge economical crisis. Both are probably correct. Some are saying it's a huge leadership crisis. Isn't it interesting how uh, you place politicians in two years of COVID? We begin to see where everything really sits and how they react in these situations. Uh, but here's the big one I'm actually really concerned about, and I believe this is true, uh, that COVID-19 has caused a huge mental health crisis crisis across the globe through many different facets, whether it be isolation, anxieties, whatever it is. Even people who have lost loved ones, I'm sure, has increased. But uh, what is God's call on our life? Paul shows us enormously today uh, a lesson for how it is that we should conduct ourselves. And going back to the AFL analogy, we are God's captains on a field of crisis right now where, believe it or not, we are living in a community and a world that is looking around for solid ground to stand on. Everything's shaky, everything they've, everything they've built their life on may have been shaken. I'm having spiritual conversations with people today that I never thought I would. Why? Because the foundations of their life have been rocked to the core. Some here today, the message from Paul is very important and we'll begin to unpack that. But some here today, the message that was for Paul is for you today. A couple of things real quick. Uh, what brings us to Acts chapter 27? Uh, one really important thing before we get to the end is in Acts 23, Jesus, Paul says, that Jesus stands before him and says, you will proclaim the gospel in Jerusalem, but also to Rome. And for those that picked up the pastor's comments last week, you'll understand a little bit about that. By the time we reach chapter 27 in Acts, Paul has already written both the letters to the Corinthians where he describes being shipwrecked three times, where he describes being afloat on the sea a night and a day and many other things that he, he went through. This is going to be Paul's fourth shipwreck throughout the course of taking the gospel. How many people today would say, oh, God's telling me something to stop getting on boats? No, Paul keeps getting on the boat. But uh, the other thing is you're reading verse 1 of chapter 27 and it says, and when it was decided that we should sail for Italy. Uh, Paul had no say in this decision. Many people right now are sitting in the bottom of a boat that you never asked for, but that's a message for when we get to the end. Uh, uh, the we that is here is Luke, the wonderful historian. Uh, Luke, who writes the gospel, Luke also writes the book of Acts, and he was a man that accompanied Paul and writes firsthand of what he sees. A couple of things, we get snapshots into the life of Paul as we go along. Uh, one is, when we read through here, we read about a man by the name of Aristarchus. I know, whatever happened to John or Terry, right? It's, uh, but Aristarchus, and we, we say, who is Aristarchus? Well, Aristarchus was a, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, we're told, but the interesting thing is the fact that he's on the boat with a Roman prisoner can pretty much only mean one thing. Well, two things, actually. One, Paul's got enormous favour with the centurion that he's travelling with. And the second one is Aristarchus would have been Paul's slave. Under Roman law, you could have a slave travel with you and tend to your needs, but there would be no other reason for Aristarchus to be there. You're thinking, I want to be Pastor Sean's slave. I have a form up the back you can <laughs> fill out. Um, uh, and you don't need to use the name Aristarchus. Some would say, isn't that a net? No, it's not. It's the other way around. So a little bit of context before we reach verse 9 and read some important stuff. Uh, Luke begins to describe, in fact, this chapter, historians, secular historians have used this chapter and have discovered enormous uh, profound information about how people conducted themselves in the first century nautically. When it comes, the, the descriptions he gives about how they travelled, where they travelled, how they used the anchors, all those sorts of things. The information in here is diabolically uh, detailed. And Luke begins his description about how they set sail for Rome. That's the important part. They're on a boat, they're going to Rome. More about that a little bit later. Then we reach verse 9 and, and Paul has a lesson because a crisis is going to come on the, the ship, and Paul has some lessons for us. Verse 9, since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast, the Feast of Atonement, I believe that would be, was already over, Paul advised them 
This is a really interesting part of the scripture. Paul advised them, Paul admonished them, Paul urged them strongly, is what that word means, saying, Sirs, I perceive. Now, if you are still carrying hard copies with you today, I'd encourage you to underline or highlight that word perceive. Really important word. What is it that Paul perceives? Uh, Paul perceives that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. And, And how many people are here thinking, hang on a second, give this guy half a cup full of water for a minute. Who brought negative Nancy, right? Uh, in all of my travels of fishing, uh, I intensely study the weather because it's enormously important. And I found, praise God, that not many weathermen are prophets because they get it wrong most of the time. However, a weatherman will take from what he, the tools that he has and he will say whatever it is, he will say there could be a, a rain tomorrow. It's really easy in Tasmania. The weatherman's got the easiest job in Tasmania. Fine, apart from raining, I think is how they've boiled it down to in, in Tasmania. You can see pretty much one of those two objectives. Uh, but uh, the weatherman might say, I perceive. Maybe he would use that word. That's, maybe we can begin to understand. And you know what, although we want the weatherman to stand up every night and tell us it's going to be clear blue skies, what is it in Brisbane? We're aiming for 32, is that what we're aiming for? 32 degrees, light winds, Uh, uh, the reality is that's not always the case. Sometimes what's required of us as God's captains on the field is to stand up and call things exactly how they are. If I can take a little bit of liberty this morning, maybe there are some on the boat that go, who brought you? Negative Nancy, you're right. You know, I I don't want you speaking that. No, the reality is Paul perceived, God had laid something on his heart and he stands up. This is pivotal right now. For everything that's about to happen, this moment is pivotal. Paul stands up and speaks God's word into the situation. We need more men and women of God that will stand up and say, I perceive. We need God's word for now. If you're in your prayer closet, pray for that. Pray, God, give us your word. Give us faithful men and women to give us your word now that will stand up and say, do you know the weatherman could say right now that a cyclone is sweeping down the coast and it will bring winds of 200 kilometres an hour, it will bring torrential rain and possible flooding and we could walk outside, look at clear blue skies and go, that guy's crazy. Paul says, I perceive, and I find something really interesting in the book of Acts that might help some people here today, is whenever God had a word for word message to a person, it came by an angel, it came by Jesus standing next to them, and sometimes in visions and in dreams. But rarely did it sound like I went down and saw the guy at the milk bar and got a couple of litres of milk. It didn't sound like that kind of conversation. However, what we do read is we read words like Paul perceived. God had laid something on his heart. We, we, we read about people moving in the unction of the Holy Spirit. We, we, we read words like Paul saying, we wanted to go to such and such a place, but the Holy Spirit forbade us. Put up roadblocks. In other places, uh, we read verses like it seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit. Paul didn't stand up and say, God told me. Paul stood up and said, you know, I perceive. What did you perceive, Paul? Shouldn't apologise for it either. If God lays something on your heart, share it. Don't apologise for it. Verse 10, saying, So as I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Really important verse coming up. Verse 11, But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. Here's where the trouble begins. When we act in ignorance of God's word, here's where the trouble begins. We live in a culture today and that culture is beginning to seep or soak into the church. It's a culture of we will consult anybody and we will consult everybody before we consult God. And this is where we get ourselves into trouble. There's more trouble coming in a moment. We get ourselves into trouble. God has not called us to seek the advice. I'm not saying we shouldn't. 
But I'm saying let's go to God first. Let's keep reading and see what happens in this process here. Verse 12, And because the harbour was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided, the majority decided, the majority decided to put out to sea from there. I've found something. Uh, I've only been a pastor for about five years. I've only been alive. I think I celebrated my 30th birthday not that long ago. (laughs) Not that long ago. But I've learned something. God never is on the side of the majority. I have never seen God flowing with a majority. I've looked through the Bible. He doesn't seem to be on the side of the majority. In fact, in most cases, he's in opposition to the majority. Western culture, if I can be honest with you for a second, I'll get back to preaching in a moment, but if I can be honest with you for a second, we live in a culture today that is all about what does the majority say. Well, everybody says. Everybody says such and such. Everybody says that life really begins when, you know, when somebody comes out of the womb. That's, that's tragically wrong. People say many things, and uh, if you read Scripture, you will find it's very dangerous going with the crowds. You will find that in the Gospels we read, the crowd uh, on Palm Sunday is, is yelling, Hosanna in the highest, and by Friday they are yelling, crucify him. Same crowd. Uh, Men and women of God, can I implore you, can I urge you, can I challenge you today as God's captains in this crisis, in whatever crisis it is, can we no longer seek the word of the majority and can we seek the word of the authority? God doesn't care what the majority says. Paul will tell you, (laughs) just as a digression, Paul will tell you that Going the way of the authority is often a lonely road. Unfortunately, uh, being the fisherman that I am, we could probably describe the Christian life a lot like salmon. Has anybody ever watched documentaries on salmon? David Attenborough has done some wonderful... You ever notice that the whole life of the salmon is all about going upstream against the current, jumping... They jump enormous hurdles, going past bears and everything, all so that they can lay eggs and die. Wow, what a... Isn't that a lot like the Christian life? We're always going upstream. And the lesson in that is all you have to do to end up back down the river, stop swimming. God's called us not to go with the majority, but to go the way of the authority. If I'm not in trouble yet, I'm about to get into trouble. Verse 12, and because the harbour was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbour of Crete facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Verse 13, we're going to skip some verses in a moment. Verse 13, now when the south wind blew gently, supposing, <laughs> if, you've got a, if you've got a hard copy this morning, highlight that word supposing. Uh, Now, when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose. When I was in the forestry, uh, I had a lot of new guys come and go, and we used to ride quad bikes. I used to pull trailers and and run boxes all over the place on quad bikes. Everybody wanted to ride the motorbike. We had one guy who was uh, expert in everything. Anybody ever met one of those guys? We had one of these guys that was an expert in everything that was basically begging me for his turn to ride the motorbike. Turns out, one particular day, I thought, you know, I'll kind of stick it to this guy. So what I did was we actually had to finish five kilometres away from where all the product was. So we finished this end of the block and we had to change species of trees. So we went all the way around the main road and loaded up. Now, three times throughout the course of the day, I told the guys what the plan was. I said, this is going to be a real muddled up day to try and rescue it. We're not going to travel all the way back to where we finished. We're going to start at the shed and work our way back. Three times I told these guys. I made it clear to these guys before we even started. So everybody was on board. I didn't have to speak to anybody. We went back. We did everything we had to do. About 11 o'clock in the morning. And I I thought, you know what? Because we only have to move 200 metres, (laughs) knock yourself out, Richo. You can ride the motorbike today. So Richo gets on the motorbike, puts his helmet on, didn't help us do a thing. And he's sitting there revving it. And all I said was, let's go, guys. There was a puff of dust. and, And Richo was gone. Didn't see him until half past three. Comes back, throws the helmet on the ground. He had steam coming out of every orifice of his body. 
Where have you been? I've been now, who, only in Tasmania do people wait, what, four and a half hours? I've been waiting all day for you guys. I said to Richo, where did you go? Well, I, here it is, quoting him verbatim, I supposed we were going to start where we finished and I went four and a half kilometres and I've been sitting there the whole time waiting for you guys. I said to Richo, I said three times I told you. Very simple task, mate. Do as you're told. Stop supposing. I think if God had a word today for us, we can get into really big trouble when we suppose. When God's already given us his word, there's no room for us to suppose. We need men and women of God, and sometimes we can use the term men of God loosely, but men and women of God, we need men and women of God who will stand up and stop supposing and start declaring God's word. Far too often in church circles, I've heard of people who suppose, who, 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 you know, the south wind, although it looks like favourable circumstances, you know, the south wind always blows in the worst storms. What they're looking at in the harbour is, you know, we've got all the favour because the south wind's blowing, everything's nice and calm and gentle. And how many of us look at favourable circumstances and suppose that we have God's backing to do what we want to do? And I'm not saying that we should live in ignorance of circumstances, but when you've got God's word and those circumstances are in contradiction to God's word, you're heading for trouble. Sounds like this, I've heard this. In the church that we were in some years ago, I could quote a lady verbatim who said, well, you know, it seems like everything's lined up. God wants me to be happy. Oh, okay, but happiness meant that I need to divorce my husband and run off with a family friend that has recently divorced his wife. Okay, what part of the Bible did it say that you need to be happy like that? When you've got God's word and you start supposing, that's when we get into a whole lot of trouble. God never asked us to suppose. God's given us his direction. We need men and women of God who will stand up and deliver his word in the season, who will stop going with the majority and cease supposing and live according to God's word. Now, when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, we haven't finished with Paul yet. He's got a shoes lesson for us coming right up. They weighed anchor and sailed along crate close to the shore, but soon a tempestuous wind. I love that word tempestuous. It's where we in English get our word for typhoon. Might give you a little bit of a sneak peek into what these guys are facing. I have fished. If only I could describe some of the weather I fished with my stepfather, you, I can tell you what tempestuous looks like. I don't know if anybody can remember the Sydney to Hobart. Sydney to Hobart race, that failed doom race when most of the boats... Uh, didn't make it and many people died on the way down. Well, that weather system was blowing down the Tasmanian coast and it's between uh, uh, Victoria and Tasmania and the Coast Guard on the east coast of Tasmania, he's heading out to go and uh, be ready to meet the boats in case they're in trouble and told my stepfather in a 14-foot dinghy, he better get back in. And the guy said, I, I couldn't believe my eyes when you were disappearing behind the waves all the time. <laughs> it was a 14 foot, that's the kind of weather we used to fish in regularly. I know what tempestuous looks like. These guys are in for a world of hurt. Many situations in our lives, just as I digression, so many times we end up in tempestuous life storms because at pivotal moments, just like these guys, we've ignored the word of God and we've run off on our suppositions. Yeah, preach it, Pastor. I'm going to have to get a crowd up here to kind of... <laughs> but soon a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster, a particular wind that they described that was enormously vicious in that time, struck down from the land. You can read the description, but listen to how Paul, uh, sorry, how Luke finishes this off. Verse 18, since we were violently storm-tossed, they began to next day jettison the cargo, starting with the kale. That's for you, Baz, when you're at home. <coughs> we all, kale first. They started to jettison the cargo, and on the third day they threw the ship's tackle. The ship's tackle, the best word to 
to understand the word tackle is all the furnishings and all the furniture. They're chucking everything they can get their hands on overboard to try and save the ship. They're running ropes. Uh, they had a system where they would drag ropes under the boat and secure them over the boat tightly to stop the boat breaking apart. They're doing everything in their power to stop themselves from succumbing to the storm. I'm going to do everything I can, but they're not going to be able to stop what's coming. Have a listen to the words of the historian Luke here. Verse 19, on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands and when neither sun nor stars appeared. Why is that important? Because in the first century, they navigated by the suns and the stars. These guys are saying, we've been blown across the sea. We haven't navigated in almost 14 days. We've got no idea where we are. We've got no idea how we got here. We've got no idea where. Anybody ever been in a situation of life that sounds a little bit like that? If not, put your seatbelt on. God just may be taking you there. Verse 20, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. We have no hope of rescuing the ship. We have no hope of surviving it. Only Brother Luke knew that he has quite possibly described the culture, the people that are around us, friends. They live in a time now when they are doing everything. They are chucking things off their life. They are, they are running to all the worlds of this world and they are just like this. When all hope of being saved, there is all hope is dashed. Listen to the despair. Listen to the desperation. Listen to the discouragement in that statement. But all oh, enter the man of God. Isn't it interesting how that in the most fiercest storms, God always has his man or his woman on the boat? Verse 21. I love this. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them. Paul stood up among them. Here we have, and I'll jump forward to give you a little bit of a snapshot. We have 276 people on the boat and one man stands up amidst a desperate, despondent situation. One person will stand up. Can I ask us, can I urge you this morning, as the people of God, it is time for us to stand up. It is time for us to make our voice heard. It is time for us to stand up in this culture right now. And Paul has a wonderful message. And I believe that it's a great lesson for each and every one of us. What does Paul say? Well, first of all, Paul does the very Tasmanian thing. Uh, Man, you should have listened to me. (laughs) Uh, Paul says, first and foremost, let's cut the chase here. Uh, I told you so. Uh, All right, let's set that aside for a moment. Uh, now that we're past the kind of Tasmanian dealings, what does Paul have to say? Uh, he stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me. This could have been averted and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and this loss. The next word is the biggest word, I think, in this whole chapter yet. Isn't God glorious? Isn't God wonderful? Isn't he so merciful and gracious? Uh, they've decided we're going to listen to everybody else. We're going to go our own way. We're going to sail. We're going to find safe harbour. We've got all the favourable conditions and they've made a whole mess of everything and God has a yet for them. Yet, Paul will go on to say, not one hair on your head will be lost. All 276 people will be saved. I'm kind of paraphrasing as we come to a conclusion now. All 276 on the boat will be saved. But sometimes, and this may be a message that resonates very heavily with people here today, sometimes when God wants to take us to the shores of salvation, the process is by a shipwreck. God could have calmed the storm. Done it before. God could have taught him a lesson, calmed the storm, said, next time. No. God says, I'm going to get you to the shores. Paul's got a message for these guys, a profound message. Do you know in the middle of all that's going on, these guys, these guys have basically given up. These guys are hanging on white knuckle rides, right? kind of like the fishing trips with my stepfather. You hang white knuckle onto the boat as you're going out and coming back. But uh, the reality is uh, Paul has a wonderful message in all of this. Have a listen to what Paul says. Man, you should have listened to me. Watch me move past that part. You should have listened to me. Uh, yet now I urge you to take heart. Take heart. Be cheerful. We, we, we have a message right now. 
We have a message for a despondent people. We have a message right now, a message that says, hey, you know what? Take heart. You don't have to be spiritually thirsty anymore. You don't have to wallow in your sins and your nakedness anymore. Thank you for pointing out that those on the cross were naked. The passion of the Christ didn't quite go that far. But Jesus, everybody that was crucified was stripped naked. Oh, the shame of that. Jesus bore all of it. You don't have to be despondent. And although we all make a mess of our lives, <laughs> we've done it, there is a yet for every person in this room. No matter where you find yourself today, there is a yet for you. And I don't want to be the negative Nancy, but sometimes getting to where God wants to take you is going to cost you a shipwreck. Maybe God's got to dash you on the rocks to get you to the shores of salvation. Al Gore thought he had the inconvenient truth. No, that one's very inconvenient. I love what comes next. I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Really, really profound verse that's coming up. Verse 23, for this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. What a statement. <laughs> you guys are hanging on white knuckle. I'm having a talk with an angel up the back. We need more women, men and women of God like this, I tell you. <clears throat> to the God who I belong and whom I worship, he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar and behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. God doesn't grant us anything we don't ask for. Paul's hunkered up the back praying for everyone. What's the man of God doing when the waves are washing in and everyone's lassoing the boat and everyone's chucking the car? He's up having a prayer meeting. We just went past the message for Paul. We'll come back to it in a moment. God has granted you all those who sail with you, so take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told, but we must run aground on some island. You will be saved. You will not die. You are going to reach the shore safely, but it's going to cost you the boat, and it's going to cost you everything you've got in the process. Here's the irony of the gospel this morning, if there is such a thing as an irony of the gospel. <laughs> Salvation is 110,000% free. You could not earn it even if you wanted to. It costs you kind of, no money, no nothing, but it will cost you everything you have. Jesus made no bones about that. If they will come after me, let him take up his cross. Don't show any hands here this morning, but is, is there anybody here feeling like God's running you aground right now? I've been here a number of times. Smith Wigglesworth would say, before I could reach this place, God broke me a thousand times. What's Smith Wigglesworth saying? Before I reached these shores, God shipwrecked me many times. <laughs> we never learn, you know. In reality, he's got to keep shipwrecking us. Paul four times, so if he's four times, me 400. <clears throat> Verse 27. When the 14th night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms, 36 metres, I believe. A little further on, they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed. Isn't it interesting? Everybody prays. <laughs> when things are imminent, everybody prays. For day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape, this is a really important verse now. As we're talking about God's sovereignty, we've been singing about God's sovereignty this morning. Really important verse coming up, verse 30. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, hang on a second, what did God tell you? God said to hang on, I'm going to dash you on the rocks, but I'll get you to the shore. Where are you going? 
And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, verse 31, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Unless these, hang on a second. Unless these men stay in the ship, we're all going to die. Wow. And here we have, this is really a sermon series for another decade, I reckon. But here we have a wonderful picture of God's awesome and complete sovereignty and man's responsibility. God has said, you've got to stay on the boat. You get off, you're on your own, cobber. God's sovereignty, man's response. Beautiful, beautiful passage. You could fast forward to the end and you could see this verse, verse 44, and the rest of them were on planks and on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to the land. Praise the living God. The message from Paul to us this morning is we are God's captains in the storms and the turmoil and the crises of life. He has called us to stand up, to speak his word that he lays on our heart, not to go with the majority and to cease supposing. If you read through that whole chapter, you'll read that he, Paul goes around the sailors and he's saying, you guys need to take some food. Why? Because we're about to be dashed on the rocks and you're going to need your energy to swim. <laughs> Paul knew. Amazing. He gives all of these guys food and then right there on the decks, he gives thanks to God. Wow. When I read this passage, I was enormously humbled. I was enormously humbled when I read how Paul, the reality is he saved, God used him as an instrument of salvation for 276 people. But the message for Paul may be for others here this morning. And the message for Paul is two shipwrecks, three shipwrecks, four shipwrecks, 400 shipwrecks. What's the message to Paul? I will get you to Rome. There are people in this room who God has spoken to. There are people in this room that God has laid a calling on. There are people in this room that God has given you a vision of the future and what that may look like and you think it's dashed on the rocks and you think you're stuck on the Isle of Malta. That's where Paul is right now, about to be bitten by a snake. It just gets getting better for Paul. Let's light a fire, okay, get bitten by a snake. And, and you think you've been dashed on the rocks and you think God's forgotten about all of that. I want you to hear the message to Paul today. I am taking you to Rome. The sovereign God who preserved Paul. Paul, Paul should have been dead a thousand times. If you read the book of Acts, he should have been dead a thousand times. This guy was beaten. This guy had plots of assassination against him. We had guys who made pledges. We're not going to eat until we kill Paul. That's real. That's, like, that's Tasmanian kind of stuff. Paul was beaten. He was, he was flogged. He was imprisoned. He was stoned. Something a little bit different than the folk from Nimbin. But he, he, he was stoned and left outside for dead. What's the message for Paul? What's the message for all of us? What's the message for the Rock Christian Church? I'm taking you Rome. There may be challenges along the way. There may be some COVID 19s along the way. And I don't care what politicians we have. I don't care what happens on the landscape of the globe. If you want to pray right now, pray that Russia doesn't cross that boundary. Pray that they don't go into Ukraine. That could get real messy real quick. So if you pray, pray for that. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know this. Whatever comes, whatever storm blows, whatever waves beat against the boat of the Rock Christian Church, God is going to take us to Rome. And there are individuals in this room today, I don't care how old you think you are, you all look young to me, by the way. I think I've just rescued all the stuff I was in trouble for. I don't care how old you are and I don't care how 
far past it you think you are, God is still taking you to Rome. Let's pray. Father, you are the sovereign God of the universe. You are the one who is seated on the throne. You are the one who upholds us in your hands. You are our rock. You are our fortress. You are the firm rock on which each and every one of us will stand. Lord, there are people in this room today that you have told them, like you told Paul, you're going to Rome. Lord, you haven't revoked that at all. Lord, I pray that they would once again get back on board the ship. I pray for men and women of God today, Father. Men and women who will stand up, declare the truth of God, live the truth of God, no matter the storms that come. Use us. Use us to be your men and women, I pray. In the wonderful name of Jesus.